then they're also kind of piling on 20 billion pounds worth of unfunded commitments on top of it, which makes it completely, the sum's not adding up. And by the way, the reason this matters and the reason why our pledge on the public finances matters is because this ends up being about the family finances of working people. Because, you know, what would the Tory party 20 billion lead to? It would end up leading to very significant cuts in services for, for working people or significantly higher and or significantly higher taxes for working people, VAT and all of that, exactly what they promised they wouldn't do before the last general election. So uh, what I would say, Sam, uh, to your important question is, look, ours is the sensible plan. Ours is a sensible balanced plan. And I think actually that's what the British people uh, want. Right. Um, there's a lady at the back. Yep. Hi, Catherine Boyle from HM, or from CNBC. I was just wondering, with the targets for um, raising money from uh, track, from cracking down and tax avoidance, just how do you think you're going to get HMRC to get this kind of money? I mean, this is an organisation which has had the HSBC files for however many years and managed to have one potential prosecution. How can you set that level of uh, figure on how on 7.5 billion on how much they're going to more they're going to be able to recover? It's Catherine's. It? Yeah. Catherine, I think it's a good, a good and important question. And uh, that's why we announced our, one of the reasons we announced our review into the customs and practices of HMRC. Because, look, I think there is a widespread recognition that we need to change our approach to tax avoidance and tax evasion. And that is partly about policy, and that is partly about approach. I just meet lots of small and medium-sized businesses who say to me, look, I seem to be chased for every penny by HMRC, why do they do these deals with these big companies and indeed sometimes individuals and let them off the hook? And so it's precisely for that reason that we're doing this. And look, there is going to be a change. Uh, with the Labour government, there is going to be a change in the way we approach tax avoidance. You know, we're, we're not going to carry on with a situation where rules that can't be justified, and non-DOMS is the obvious example, rules that can't be justified are somehow defended because it's said, well, look, you know, it's, yeah, I know it's, un, you know, it's indefensible, which seems to be the Tory position. It's indefensible, but we're going to keep it in place. Uh, look, I don't think that's a good position. Uh, I think if the rule's indefensible, it should be got rid of, uh, and that's what we're going to do. And so it is a change in the approach that we are uh, looking at. I'm going to take... Are you a journalist, this gentleman? Are you? No, you're not a journalist. I'm not going to take you. Sorry. Uh, 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 got the people waving. I'll take Allegra Stratton from, from Newsnight. The IFS that you so revere, you just said you did, has said that from 2016 it would be coherent and would meet George Osborne's charter for you to do zero billion of cuts. Do you rule that out right now? Yes. Uh, we said, look, we said very clearly there are going to have to be reductions in unprotected areas. And we couldn't have been plainer about that. Look, our objective, Allegra, is to have a surplus on the current budget and to have the national debt falling as soon as possible in the next parliament. We're absolutely serious about deficit reduction and we're absolutely serious about making the reductions that I've talked about. Something slightly different. When you, became... you don't get two questions, I don't Everybody think. Everybody else has. When you became leader, you said... <laughs> OK, go on then. I'm when feeling became, generous. I'm uh, feeling generous. When you became Make it a nice question. When you became leader, you said you wanted to move on from New Labour. Which of the policies in this manifesto today would not have been in the 97 manifesto? <laughs> you can do it. Go on. Actually, you could have asked me a better question, which is which of the policies wouldn't have been in the 2010 manifesto, which I wrote. But anyway... Uh, 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 unfortunately, you didn't ask that, so I'm not going to answer it. Uh, 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 look, look uh, the, the, the answer I would say, and I said it in my remarks, is I'm not offering to carry on while the last Labour government left off, because, partly because circumstances have changed. And if I can put, put my finger on two things in particular, I think we've learnt so many lessons from the financial crisis. But above all, we've learnt a lesson about regulation, about the banks, about what needs to change. But I think we've also learnt a wider lesson about our country and about the way our country works. You know, I think that there is a sense, increasingly among people, that it feels like a country where not just people lead parallel lives, but where there is one rule for one set of people and another rule for another set of people, and we can't carry on with this. And, you know, I, I am, I think, holding vested interests to account, holding powerful interests to account is an incredibly important part of what I stand for, and I think what people want uh, in the next government. And they're certainly not going to get it from David Cameron, but they are going to get it from me. 
The second point I would make to you, and this is again where circumstances have changed, is that we are dealing, and it goes to your point about the deficit actually, you know, look, we're living in a world which is a very, very different world, and your question was about 97, uh, of the world that Tony Blair and Gordon Brown inherited. And you know, that's why you know, I get asked these questions about my uh, fiscal position. I'm doing something that Tony Blair and Gordon Brown certainly didn't do in 1997, because I'm going into the election saying there are going to have to be reductions in spending outside key protected areas. So look, I think, I think part of it is about a change in circumstances and about adapting to those changed circumstances, which was Labour Party has already done. And as I've said, I've outlined today my own political project, as I've done over the last four and a half years. And it's not the same as New Labour's political project, in part because the challenges are different. To take George Eaton. I think you might be the last question, George. George Eaton, New Statesman. Um, the manifesto promises to protect the principle of media plurality by ensuring that no media outlet can get too big. Could you give any more details on this? Does this mean a cap on media ownership? And also, do you agree with those who say that that uh, pledge, combined with your pledge to implement the Leveson inquiry, explains the degree of media hostility to you? Okay. Uh, I'm glad I called you. Uh, 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 um, right. Uh, on the two parts to your uh, on the two parts to your question. Look, on the second part of your question, I think it's incredibly important that we have a free press, right? And I think it's incredibly important that we have a free press that can write what it likes about me, and they certainly have. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and, you know, that is, that is who we are as a society. I said what I said at the outset, advisedly. You know, that is the job of journalists. Uh, you know, and, and you know, I, I defend the rights of a free press. Now, we've got to have a press that doesn't uh, treat victims, and that is the point about the Leveson uh, business, that, that doesn't kind of treat victims in a way which means they have no redress. And that's what Leveson has always been about. And absolutely, we are committed to keeping our promise to the victims. O on media plurality, you you've read the words in the manifesto. It it look, it it's always been a long-standing position of us throughout this parliament that we think that there are significant issues that need to be looked at in relation to media plurality. And that's something that the next government uh, will do. I, I sort of said it with the last question, didn't I? But I kind of, you know, such a tempting bunch. Uh, the lady, the lady at the back. Hey, I'm from the Zeit in Germany. Uh, you hi. mentioned hi. You mentioned that you want to reform the European Union. Um, can you explain to me why the other European governments should negotiate with you if there's no threat of a referendum? What would you hope to achieve? Okay, thank you very, very much for your uh, question. It is important. So here's this is a big choice at this election. Look, David Cameron wanted us to believe two years ago that his strategy of threatening exit would lead to great results for Britain. Now, the, the fortunate thing about the last two years is we've had a good sort of nat what they call a natural experiment of seeing whether that's true. Uh, and he put forward uh, his own sort of uh, case about why Jean-Claude Juncker shouldn't be president of the European Commission. And he said it was going to be a great success and uh, he would gather lots of allies. Well, he lost by 26 votes to two. Now, why did he lose by 26 votes to two? It's really important to understand the reasons for this. The problem is that when David Cameron comes knocking at the door of other European leaders, people don't think he's coming to solve the problems of Britain or Europe. They think he's coming to solve the problems of the Conservative Party. Now, you know what? They're right. He is trying to solve the problems of the Conservative Party. And, 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 here, and here's the funny thing. Chancellor Merkel wasn't elected to solve the problems of the Conservative Party. She, she was elected on behalf of the people of Germany. So the, the reason why we will get far further in the reforms that we want is because engagement within Europe to reform Europe in all of Europe's interests, starting for us with Britain's interests, is absolutely the right way to get, to get reform. Let me just take this issue of immigration. I think there are lots of le European leaders uh, around, around capitals who are thinking, look, we do need to do something about this issue of benefits and access to benefits. But 
look, David Cameron's sort of kamikaze strategy is kind of a disaster for getting support. Because actually people think, oh my God, if Cameron's supporting it, that is a, a really good reason not to support it. <laughs> that, that, that has been the lesson of his approach. So actually, engagement is what is going to get us uh, success. Now, I'm going to take the last question from Chris Hope. Chris Hope, Telegraph, I'm not on your bus, but we're willing to come along one day. Um, you're, welcome I... on the, you're welcome on the bus any time, depending on the nature of this question. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually two questions. Oh, God. In, in your manifesto, you make no mention of protecting the green belt. Why is that? And also, will you, in power, stop or even... Um, will you stop the Tory plans to increase the 40% threshold to £50,000? OK, on the... Uh... On the, on, let me deal with both of those questions. On the green belt, our position is actually to keep the planning laws as they are, but with one change, and this is very important for Telegraph uh, readers, which is to put brownfield first, and actually to restore the brownfield first principle. And, and that is the right thing to do. On the second point, Ed Bull set this out the other day. Look, we want to reduce the number of people uh, paying the 40p uh, tax rate. Uh, absolutely uh, we do, and we want to raise the threshold. But look, here is the big choice that you face at this election. In a way, Chris, you set me up to, to, to make this point, which is every promise we make is a promise that we can pay for, and it is what the British people expect. And, you know... For people going to the Conservative Party manifesto tomorrow, they will have to answer the question about where their £20 billion worth of unfunded commitments are coming from. Now, yesterday on the television, George Osborne was asked 18 times uh, about the £8 billion, and he had no answer on 18 separate occasions. And look, the British people do... And look, in a way, I think it's a sign of something about this election. Uh, because I don't think the Conservative Party would necessarily have done this three weeks ago. I think it's a sign of desperation and panic. That is what parties do. That is what parties do when, when, they, when, they run, when they run out of road and they run out of ideas and they start coming up with a whole bunch of commitments without any kind of clue about how they're paying for it. That is where the Conservative Party has got it. They didn't unveil it in the budget, this commitment. It wasn't announced in the budget. Suddenly, you've got on Friday this rail fares thing when Patrick McLaughlin had said that it he'd accused us of committing to this. I mean, get this. He said, imagine, he said, Labour's going to commit to this thing. It's completely bonkers, and it's, you know, five years, £1.8 billion. Pounds, and then he committed to it, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and then similarly on the £8 billion, similarly in relation to the unfunded uh, tax cuts. So, so, look, it is a sign of where we are in this election campaign. Because, you know, we're a campaign that has been absolutely consistent about where we stand, about the fact that it was our first pledge unveiled in December, uh, that we were going to show how every promise uh, was paid for. Let me um, just say a couple of final words to, the, to this um, uh, audience. Look, first of all, I want to thank all of you, uh, not just for being here today, but for your incredible support for me since I became the leader of this party. Uh, I'm incredibly proud to be leader of your party. Look, so secondly, let me just say this, because this goes to my politics and this election. It's really great that you're all here today. What's even more great is all of the things you're going to do over the next three and a half weeks to elect a Labour government. And I'm absolutely deadly serious about this. Look, this election could come down to a few hundred votes in a few dozen constituencies. And the great thing about an election like that is that all of you can be the difference to the outcome of this election. And so, look, if you've got any DIY that needs doing between now and May the 7th, I'd put it off till May the 8th. <laughs> Family weddings, birthday parties, uh, they, 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 can all, they can all wait. Uh, but look, this is, I'm really serious about this. You know how incredibly high the stakes are at this election. You know how incredibly high the stakes are for your communities. You know how incredibly high the stakes are for this country. You know how we can change this country. That's what our manifesto shows today. As I often say, politics is too important to be left to politicians. Because the reason change has happened throughout our history is because people made it happen. Workers' rights, the NHS, rights for gay and lesbian people. <laughs> and here's the thing, and, he and here's the thing, the Tory party is not just a desperate party in a panic. They're a party that has people that 
that doesn't have people that want to knock on doors for them. Now, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't want to knock on doors for the Tory party either. But that is the difference. That is the difference. They may have the billboards, they may be able to outspend us, but we have the people. And that has been true throughout our history. It's true now. We know our responsibility. Let's change this country. Thank you.